On December 25, 1640, Pierre de Fermat wrote a letter to Marin Mersenne detailing one of the most famous results in number theory. It's known as Fermat's Christmas Theorem because of the date he wrote the letter, but it's better known as Fermat's Two Squares Theorem. The theorem states that primes of the form 4k plus 1, that is, primes that when divided by 4 give 1 as a remainder, can also be represented as the sum of two squares. For example, 13 can be written as 4 times 3 plus 1, and you can represent 13 as 2 squared plus 3 squared. Likewise, 37 can be written as 4 times 9 plus 1, and you can represent 37 as 6 squared plus 1 squared. In his remarkable book, A Mathematician's Apology, G. H. Hardy wrote, This is Fermat's theorem, which is ranked very justly as one of the finest of arithmetic. Unfortunately, there is no proof within the comprehension of anybody but a fairly expert mathematician. I hope I can change that. One of the most beautiful proofs of Fermat's two squares theorem is a one-line proof by Don Zagier. Unfortunately, when you look at it for the first time, you may wonder where to even begin. However, by considering each part of the proof separately, it all comes together beautifully at the end. Remember that what we're trying to prove is that a prime of the form 4k plus 1 can be written as the sum of two squares. Note that because p is odd, then one of a squared or b squared must be even, and the other must be odd. We'll assume without loss of generality that the even one is b squared. Since an odd number squared is odd, and an even number squared is even, then b itself must be even. So we'll replace b with 2y prime. We can then factor out the 2 to get 4y prime squared. Finally, I'll replace y prime squared with yz, which we'll see why in a second. I'll also change a squared to x squared to really highlight this new formula. Instead of breaking down p into two squares, this new equation allows us to break p into a square with side length x and four rectangles with side lengths y and z. For example, if we let x equal 3, y equal 5, and z equal 1, this satisfies x squared plus 4yz equals 29, which looks like the following. We can then arrange the square and rectangles into a nice windmill shape, which we'll use later for some nice geometric intuition. Note that x is the side length of the central square, y is the length of the rectangles, and z is the height. Also note that if y equals z, then we get a sum of two squares by working backwards with our derivation. Geometrically, this can be seen by combining the four rectangles into a large square, thus forming two of them. Thus, we've transformed the problem to see if there is some combination of x, y, and z that satisfies the equation such that y equals z. This may appear to be a harder problem than what we had before, but by considering the set of windmills for a given prime p, then we start to see two things occur. For example, let's consider the set of windmills for 13. Note that there does exist a windmill where y equals z, and thus there is a solution to Fermat's two squares theorem, namely that 13 is 2 squared plus 3 squared. However, note that in this set of windmills, there is also a windmill where x equals y. That is, that the side length of the center square exactly matches the length of the rectangles. And if we consider the set of windmills for another prime, say 29, we'll see that there also exists a windmill where x equals y. In fact, there exists a windmill where x equals y for every prime of the form 4k plus 1. And furthermore, we'll note that the only windmill for both of these numbers where x equals y is of the form 1, 1, k. For 13, k is 3 in the equation and in the windmill. Likewise for 29, k is 7 in the equation and in the windmill. Now let's see why this windmill exists for every prime of the form 4k plus 1. Each rectangle has area k, and since there are 4 of them, the area overall is 4k. Then adding in the plus 1 for the central square, we get that the total area is 4k plus 1, which is exactly what we are looking for. Now we'll show that 1, 1, k is the only valid configuration. If we take our formula and replace y with x, then we can factor out an x from both terms, leaving x times x plus 4z. Since p is prime, if x is anything but 1, then this would make a decomposition of a prime number, which isn't possible. Thus, if x equals y, then x, and y, can only be equal to 1. 
I'll now switch to a bit of a different topic, but keep this idea of windmills for a given prime in the back of your mind. It'll come at the end of the proof. If we look back at the one-line proof of Fermat's two squares theorem, you'll notice that the first two words of the proof are the involution, so it probably helps to know what an involution even is. In short, it is a function which is its own inverse. In other words, a function f is an involution if f of f of x is the identity. That is, applying the function twice returns you to your original input. For example, consider the function f of x equals negative x. If we plug in a number, say 5, we get out negative 5. If we apply the function again, we get negative negative 5 equals 5, which is our original element. So this is an involution. To understand this a bit better, consider a set S with three elements. If we want to make a function f that acts on the set and involution, it means we need to come up with a function that if you apply it twice, you get the original elements back. The simplest possibility is to have an element map to itself, which means that if you apply the function twice, you still get the same element. We call these fixed elements. You could also have two elements that swap with each other. For example, blue and green swap with each other, which means that if you apply the function again, you get the elements back in their original position. It should be fairly clear that these are the only two mappings you can have, but I recommend you pause here to make sure you understand. The part that is important for our proof is when we consider how many elements our set has. Because an involution either maps elements to themselves or swaps to elements, the total number of elements in S can be represented as a sum of the number of fixed elements and the number of paired elements. Furthermore, we can consider the parity of S. The number of paired elements is always even, which means that if the number of elements of S is even, then the number of fixed points is even, since an even number plus an even number is an even number. Likewise, if the number of elements of S is odd, then the number of fixed points is odd, since an odd number plus an even number is an odd number. One really important point to emphasize here is that if s is odd, then there has to be at least one fixed point because the smallest positive odd number is 1, not 0. And you can actually look at this equation in reverse. If there is exactly one fixed point, then s is odd. Again, I know that this feels a little bit disjointed, but keep this idea of involutions in the back of your mind. So far we've looked at two very different concepts, windmills and involutions. Let's now combine them. If we have the set of windmills for a given prime p, what is the simplest involution you can think of? One involution is what I'll call the flip map. This takes your values of y and z and swaps them. It should be clear that this is an involution since if you flip y and z twice, you get back to your original set of numbers. And note that if y equals z, then this is a fixed point of the involution since you don't change anything by swapping. And hopefully you recall from the beginning of the video that if y equals z, then we get a sum of two squares and thus satisfy Fermat's two squares theorem. Thus we have again transformed our problem to seeing if the flip map has any fixed points for a prime in the form 4k plus 1. But as it turns out, it's a bit difficult to determine, so there is a workaround. What Zagier does in his one sentence proof is make another involution and showcases that this new involution has exactly one fixed point. Therefore the number of elements in the domain, in other words the set of windmills, is odd. Then since we know the number of windmills is odd, then when we consider the flip map involution, we know that it has a fixed point. And therefore there exists a solution to Fermat's two squares theorem. So what is this magic involution that we know has exactly one fixed point? As it turns out, it's a bit complicated, but this does actually have a nice geometric idea, so I'll explain this involution visually. What this involution essentially does is make the central square for a windmill as big as possible. If the central square is already as big as it can be, it makes it as small as possible by extending the arms. It should be clear that this is an involution since growing the central square to be as big as possible, then shrinking it gets back the original size. And of course if x equals y, then the central square can't get any bigger or any smaller, so the function outputs the same windmill. But here's the key idea, 
Remember that in the windmill section, I said that for a prime of the form 4k plus 1, the only windmill that has x equal y is of the form 1 1k. Thus, since there is only one fixed point, the number of windmills is odd, and thus the flip map also has to have a fixed point, thus completing the proof. Let's end this video by going back to the one sentence proof just to make sure it makes sense. We showed that the Zagier map is an involution and that it has exactly one fixed point, that is when x equals y. Then since it has one fixed point, the number of windmills has to be odd. Therefore when we consider the flip map, it has to have at least one fixed point, which means that there exists a solution to Fermat's two squares theorem. I know that this proof was a lot, and if you don't get how it works at first, don't be ashamed to watch this video again. But even on your first watch, you have to admit that this proof is elegant, right? The way that involutions and windmills come together is absolutely beautiful, and is one of the reasons I studied math for as long as I have. Math is full of these gems that connect very different areas together, and I hope to make more videos in the future showcasing the hidden beauty that surrounds this field. Hope you enjoyed the video, and Merry Christmas.